When I was first employed by Granada, the ever wonderful Granada Television, it was an extraordinary place. In the mid 1960s, one of the things that we couldn't ever understand was why hadn't all the really great American jazz musicians ever been properly recorded on screen? I mean, Billie Holiday had died, Colman Hawkins had recently died. I mean, it was all, uh, you know, not even Louis Armstrong. He'd never been properly recorded on film. And uh, astonishingly, all of the new current generation, they all seem to be dying too, killed off by drugs. Um, John Coltrane, Bud Powell, they were all going and they weren't recordings uh, ever recorded properly on film. So we thought we should put this right and that's what we set off to do. Very, very sadly, Louis Armstrong was simply then too ill. It was, I think, a year before he died. And no, it wasn't possible. So we started off with Duke Ellington, who happened to be doing his 70th birthday tour. And we set up to record him in the Manchester Free Trade Hall. And there I was, we were all set up with a multi-camera video set up. I think we had five cameras and we were all set to go. When, yet again, inevitably, life intervened and the Granada outside broadcast recording van got stuck in the Wednesday afternoon football mud and couldn't be pulled out and we couldn't do it. All we could do was to get the great Bob Auger to record it on sound and um, I think it ended up as one of the greatest of all the Ellington Band recordings. But sadly, yet again, there was no picture. And Johnny Hodges, who was completely wonderful on that recording, you should hear him doing Black Butterfly, he died very soon after. And of course Ellington himself was dead three, three years later. An opportunity gone. I then got sidetracked until about five years later I was in Washington DC trying to do some quite other film when I found that Earl Hines, one of my great, great enthusiasms, was playing in a jazz club just down the road. So we knocked him off over three afternoons in this empty jazz club and um, I think um, Hines was one of the two real geniuses I've ever met and I like to think that we managed to get him properly on film and this is the result. This film is about a piano player. Earl Father Hines. What a man. Earl Father Hines is a jazz musician, arguably the greatest still alive. This Sunday, it's his birthday, his 70th, but he still plays concerts all over the world and regularly does four or five hours a night in clubs, like the one where we made this film. Hey, hiya, my boy. Okay. Yeah, well, how are you doing? Fine, everything is fine. And the rest of the guys get no, in? you're the first one here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, come on back. All right, I'm on my way back then now. Come on back, sit down. I, I thought I'd get go. coffee, okay? Well, you got some coffee made? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I've always good. got a pot of coffee. How you got the room set up, all yeah. right? Okay, take a look. Oh, that's what good. Yeah. Well, my God, you want cream and sugar in that coffee. Okay, huh? all right. You know how you made it last time, it wasn't so hot. <laughs> well, get no, good and hot. All right. Go ahead and okay. take a look. All right. Hines was a professional piano player before the word jazz was even invented. And at 70, he's now outlived all the great names he played with. Louis Armstrong, Pat Waller, Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington. Thank it in. Nobody home. The thing that Hines has always been supremely good at is improvising. At taking a tune and changing it and reworking it and building on it as he plays so that it comes out quite different each time. What Hines enjoys is the excitement, the bravery, the risk of jumping headfirst into a tune and then, in public, having to work his way out again.
I always play from here. The way I felt is the way I always play. The way I feel. If I felt it should be a double augmented chord, I'll make it. If I feel it should be a minor seventh, I'll make it. To whatever feels good to me as far as my ear is concerned. Telephone. Take the receiver off. Huh? Take the receiver off. Take the receiver off. What do you mean, take the receiver off? Huh? <laughs> no. I don't Say mind it. Come back. You gonna be here two o'clock? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you get cancellations. I had a guy last night after I come off the first set. And he says, uh, where's Earl Fives? Just like that. I said, I am he. He said, come on, he's dead. <laughs> I had to look at him. I said, am I dead? <laughs> yeah. He said, you're yeah. not Father Hines. I said, he said, Jesus Christ, you, if I heard Father Hines, you know how far back? I said, I don't care how far I back you go. I this morning knows you from 1940 here. And so morning. I told the public that. I said, it's okay. the first time I've been approached like this. I said, I'm supposed to be dead. And, after, uh, and everybody laughed like the devil out there. So when I went back over there, he said, I apologize. He said, I was there. Yeah. I said, well, and, and uh, he said, well, I just can't believe it. And the girl, she was sitting there with him, you know. She said, I can't believe it. Yeah. I said, well, because he looks like he's knighted, I don't say I have to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It made me kind of warm, you know? In the 30s, Hines had one of the greatest of all the big bands. But after the war, as jazz became more and more intellectual, Hines virtually gave up music altogether. Then, in 1964, he was brought back to New York, and since then, he's never stopped. You're not ready yet? Yes, we are. Oh, I was just fooling. <laughs> all right. This is a little number that I wrote a year or so ago. started my life anew I found that I could make the great and that's when my confidence grew still they didn't believe I could make it neither did I I had to shake and break it and boy did I try just destroy your fears and doubts my friends you need no disguise just say if anyone else can do it so can I
How do you do it? What do you think of before you begin? Well, take for instance this particular tune. Um, you have your chord structures already written out, and the melody is there. And uh, naturally, the composer tries to write the melody as near to the chord structure that he has. And in doing so, I look at the chord structures after I learn the melody. And then I'm, I'm always two or three measures ahead so that I know just what I'm running into. For instance, when I'm playing this one here, I know the next chord is a C chord. So what I do this, I know that there are several relative chords. You see what I mean? I'm going into a C minor chord and right into C, or I go into a G seventh chord, which I noticed before, and then coming back to G. Now when I go ready to go back to C, I can make anything there, A minor, C minor, a D seventh, a flat ninth, G chord. You see what I'm talking about? You have to uh, have a photographic mind, so to speak, when you're uh, making improvisations of, of, uh, of a tune before you get to the chord. I don't know whether all pianists have that same format or not, but that's been mine ever since I started the playing because I always did like to know exactly what's hidden. That's the reason why I never did like to read a book because I always want to get to the end first. See? <laughs> so I like to know what the, uh, the story is all about. Oh, like a, likewise with this. Now, usually when, I'm, uh, when I get a tune, I kind of run over it for a while and just fool around and then I, then I photograph all these chords. And then I go for myself from then on. Hines first made recordings 52 years ago keep the wax soft, you had to make them in a steam room, stripped off to your underwear. the records he made with Louis Armstrong in 1928 that became the real classics of jazz.
in Chicago. I never saw Louis before. And um, at the Musicians' Union in Chicago, they had a union there where the, uh, all the musicians used to hang out. In fact, that was the playhouse of uh, all the youngsters. And a lot of the uh, young men used to want Excuse to blow. Me, Here's your coffee. Red oh, hot. Yeah, just some. Uh, what do you want me to sit on the piano? Oh, sit on the piano. All right, I'll sit up here then. Yeah. That's all right. You don't mind. Just uh... don't drop it down in there. Now. Well, no, no. I, I hope nobody get. Well, I hope nobody yeah. gets musical. <laughs> you know. You I'm... better get musical this afternoon now. <laughs> oh, I'll try. Yeah. Don't okay, drop then. it down in them. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're good. At that. It's good you're looking around like that. Yeah. Uh, did you put your in? Everything's in there. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I, I was talking. I didn't put a touch in there for you though. Okay. I think it's too early for a touch now. Yeah, you 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 don't mind. You sort of interrupt me. I was talking about Chicago, you know. You know about Chicago? No, I don't know a thing about Chicago. Oh well, if you hang around, now, you learn a few things. No, I'm here. not going to hang around though. Oh, oh, you're not? No, I've okay. got work to do. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, that's good. looks like you packed the house here last night. Well, that's uh, what we're here for. That's a good piano, though, isn't it? Very good. Yeah. What, what do you call it, piano? I call it piano. That's pretty I'm from good. Philadelphia. No, you're not. If you say piano. I am from Philadelphia, originally. And you say piano? I say piano. What do you say? Piano? Piano. 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 Well, I say piano. Yeah, that's just a little contrast. It's a sort of southernish, like, you know. No. Isn't it from around Georgia? Well, Georgia? South Philly. Oh. <laughs> I, I was really born in South Philly. You're, you're getting worse every time I just long <laughs> And I, I moved to West Philly. Well, you're from where? Uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Right. I, I, I'm, well, in the same state. Right, yeah. I'm just down the road a piece. That's right, up the road. No, I said down the road. You said up the road. Well, Have you ever seen the map of Pennsylvania? Is Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh sits down here. Philadelphia sits up there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's below? Down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was above. No, no. no. Mm -mm. Hey, I'm going to put some more coffee in for you. All right. Okay. That's see you good. later. All right. See you later. Oh, pardon me for I was so interrupted there. I, um... You were telling us about how you first met Louis and, you know... Well, we met together. in Chicago, and uh, so Louis says, well, what do you play? I said, I play piano. He said, why didn't you sit in when we was playing over there? I said, oh, I didn't want to interfere with you people. I thought you had something private going on, you know. And so he said, no, no, we didn't with his foggy voice. He always had that foggy voice. And then when Louis started playing, and I was started playing, and then Louis looked at me so peculiar, and uh, so I said, am I making the wrong chords? And he says, no, he says, but your style is like mine. You know, so I said, well, I said, I uh, wanted to play trumpet, and I said, but uh, it used to hurt me behind my ears because my father played cornet. And I said, so I played on piano what I wanted to play on trumpet. He said, no, that's, way, that's my style. That's what I like. And he and I became very close friends then. It was Heinz who freed the piano from the rhythm section and first gave it a voice of its own. Whenever it hit a chord, and I was curious and wanted to know what the chord was made of. And I used to execute that way, see? Say, for instance, I'm doing this. In doing that, I would then begin to play like the other instruments. But back in those days, we didn't have what they call the, amplifi uh, the amplification. So uh, the singers used to use megaphones, and the instruments were just blowing on their own. And when it would come to the piano, they were mostly upright pianos. They didn't have any grands at that time. That was to our... Uh, for us to use uh, as far as advancement in bands, it was an upright. And uh, so when they give me a solo, I'm playing single fingers like I was doing it quite often. In those great big halls, they could hardly hear me. 
So I had to think of something to so I could cut through this big band. So I started using what they call trumpet style, which was octaves. And I like this. So when I start around. They can hear me out front. And that's why they call it trumpet style piano. And that's what changed the, the style of piano playing at that particular time. You ever see him look down at the keys? Seldom. Right? I watched him yesterday here during rehearsal. He, uh... It looks like he's looking into the end of his pipe. You know, see if it's still smoking. <laughs> uh, let me see. I'd like to sort of do. Oh, I don't like my pipe. No, I haven't got my pipe. So I'll forget about it. Memories of You, a lovely tune by Ubi Blake. Do you know who's playing here? Uh, I didn't pay any attention to it. Earl Father Hines, would you know? No, I never heard of him. There you go. See? I told you he was too young, Charlie. You don't know Earl Father Hines. He's too young. <laughs> if you ask him if he knows the Beatles, yes. Uh, how about Monty Alexander, no? No. See there? I knew you were too young for it. Yeah. Who's going to be down here? Pearl Bailey. Pearl Bailey, huh? You know of her? Yeah, I've heard of her. <laughs> You've heard of her? <laughs> you should have heard of her. She's on television every day this week.
December 1929, Heinz took a band into Chicago's vast Grand Terrace Club and stayed for 12 years. Their shows went out on radio and Earl Heinz became the most broadcast band in America. And at that time, our country was, uh, everybody was dancing. And uh, the, that's the reason for the big band was because of some of these places that we would play didn't have amplification and you had to enlarge your band. You had to get four trumpets and three trombones and four or five saxophones to be heard. That's the reason for the big band. It wasn't necessary to have it because you can get some of the same effects out with a 10-piece band as you can out of an 18-piece band. <laughs> began to tune in that little station because they'd heard so much about the Grand Terrace that uh, they just wanted to find out through curiosity what was happening. <laughs> the next thing you know, we began to get people from what we call the Gold Coast. And that was the people from way over on the north side of Chicago that had an awful lot of money. It used to be limousines with their chauffeur sitting out there two blocks long. It was against the law to sell a bottle of whiskey or beer, so they bootlegged it. And then your speakeasy started. In other words, you would close this place. I mean, they closed the place, and then, uh, so what happens? They turn it into a speakeasy. You had to know Joe to get in, right? So you still drank the same thing, except the racketeers come in on it. One night I was sitting in the kitchen and a guy comes back there with three guys and his name was Fusco. He was a lieutenant for Al Capone. And he says to Fox, who was the manager and the owner, his name was Ed Fox, he says, Ed, uh, we come in to take 25% of the club. So, so Ed said, who's we come out? What do you mean? I says, I, can, I don't need no, he says, well, you have to have protection. He says, I don't need no protection. I've been here two years. I'm doing all right. He says, what well, you have to have protection. There's other gangs going to come in here and say the same thing, and we don't want that to happen to you. So he says, well, I don't want no protection. He says, and you gangsters get out of my place and all one word pass on another until finally, he said, well, you got two nice boys. I know you like your boys, don't you? He said, well, what do you mean? He couldn't talk good English. He used to say, what do you mean? And uh, Pennsylvania and, and all that, you know. So he uh, says, what are you talking about? He says, well, he says, well, you uh, like your children, you like your boys, and we'd like to see you keep them. Al came in there and uh, one night and called the whole band and show together and said, now, we want to let you know our position. He says, uh, we just want you people to tend to your own business. We'll give you all the protection in the world. He said, we want you to be like the three monkeys. You hear nothing, you see nothing, and you say nothing. And that's what we did. And I used to hear many things, many of the things that they were going to do, but I never uh, did tell anyone. And sometimes the police used to come always looking for some, a fall guy. He used to come in and say, Earl, what were they talking about? I said, I don't know. So well, you were sitting right there. I said, yeah, I sit on the bus too, but I don't pay attention to what people are saying. So I said, no, you're not going to pit me, because they had a habit of putting the pictures of these different people that would bring information in the paper. And the next day you find them out there in the lake somewhere, swimming around there with, a, with some uh, uh, chains attached to their feet and all that, you know what I mean? I 
I like that. I like to hear the old man talk, though. Don't you, Charlie, though? I call him Big Daddy. He's interesting, though, to, to listen to him. You know, going back to that speakeasy days when he played in those speakeasies and those, uh... No. Uh, what did he call it? Hotels or nightclubs that he played in? Yeah, where they served the liquor in the coffee cup? Yeah. And Showtime? Yeah. for something all the time. And oftentimes I get lost. And uh, most times the uh, people that are around me an awful lot know when they see me smiling, they know I'm lost and I'm trying to get back. But it, it makes it much more interesting because then uh, you do things that surprise yourself. And after you hear the recording, it makes you a little bit happy too. You say, oh, I didn't know I could do that, which you don't if you're doing a lot of uh, what you call fooling around and, and trying to find out just how many different chords can go into the next uh, uh, passage, you know. And uh, while doing that, why, uh, if you're uh, a little doubtful, now when I was playing classical music, I would dare, wouldn't dare get away from what I'm reading. If you notice all of the symphonic musicians, they have played uh, some of those classical tunes for years but uh, they wouldn't vary from one note. They constantly, and they, every time they play, they have to have the music. So that's why some classical musicians, it's very difficult for them to try to learn how to play jazz. Thank you. 
have a lot to do with my playing. I mean, this is a guy explaining to his girlfriend, what the hell, Jesus Christ. I mean, I hear a lot of things, but that's not true. See, so when you're saying that to a person, you're saying that sincerely, and I try to get that feeling on the piano. Almost like I'm trying to talk. I try to get that. I don't know. I can't explain it, Charlie. I can't explain it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, I just love this. I'm going to play that tonight. Is that on? Partial. They're all partial. Yeah. None of them light up as much as they should. Now, you going to keep these on? Over the last few years, almost all the great names of the jazz age have died including Al Hines' two great friends, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. Uh, Charlie, how about, how about uh, his theme song? Louis' theme song. Uh...
time as they always say looking for a good audience thank you thank you well I would like to give my conception of a number I've been associated with over a period of years from the Grand Terrace Cafe called the Boogie Woogie on the St. Louis Blues oh. 